Tracy Wigfield is the developer of the uh, revival reboot, whatever you want to call yeah. it, of Saved by the Bell. I'm Matt Noble at Gold Derby, and I wanted to ask you, Tracy, um, what was it like? Oh, no, sorry, not what was it like, but what was the most important thing to get right for Saved by the Bell, the 2020 version? Yeah, I mean, I think the most important thing was um, getting is striking the right tone. You know, the original show I was a huge fan of, um, but it was a kid show. And when I was watching it, I was a kid, you know, and I thought it was I thought it was funny. But it also I think it's had such a cult following because, you know, people also like kind of making fun of it because um, it was, you know, a squeaky clean kind of kids morning show. And so. I really wanted uh, my show to be a like adult comedy uh, that people my age who grew up with the show uh, would like and enjoy. So it was just making sure, you know, it was doing this thing I had not seen done before going from a multi-cam to a single cam, um, you know, and, and just making sure that it didn't feel like weird, <laughs> that the whole show didn't just feel like some strange experiment or something. Yeah. Like, and, I guess, like, how do you sort of find that sort of balance? Because I think it, something that sort of you do with this show that is uh, not done in a lot of the reboots and revivals and things like that is you sort of have to um, walk the fine line between sort of this homage that sort of pays respect to the sort of original while right. at the same time sort of being this sort of almost like, I don't know, parody is the right word, but sort yeah. of like sort of tongue in cheek, sort of look at the original as well. Yeah. I mean, I, I think a big thing uh, we had going for us was I, I was a genuine fan of the show and had seen every episode and, and knew them all backwards and forwards, as were a lot of our writing staff. Like uh, one of our writers, this guy, Dashiell Driscoll, um, who I just kind of found on the internet had made a series of videos called Zach Morris's trash a couple of years ago, kind of making fun of um, Zach and what a terrible person he was. And, you know, um, but you can't do that or make a show like this if it's not coming from a genuine place of, of love. And, you know, if it didn't bring me great joy when I was a kid. So I think like, you know, I, I don't think we go too far and I, I haven't gotten a lot of complaints from fans of the original being like, why are you destroying this thing I loved as a kid? Because I think like as much as we're poking fun at it, it is a, you know, it is a comedy in its own right. And it also, uh, you know, the homages we do to the original show, uh, they're coming from a good place, I guess. Yeah. As a, as a fan of the original series, what was the thing you were most excited to sort of bring back? Um, you know, it, it, there was, there, I was excited as, you know, as a show creator and I would have been as a viewer to kind of see what, uh, the old characters were doing. And, you know, in the very beginning of developing this, it was kind of like, well, is this a totally new thing? And you don't see any people from the original, but it was, it was important to me to get as many people, as many of the old cast on the show as possible, uh, just because it's like, well, what are we doing this for? Like, I could have just created, you know, a Mean girl style, like mm. high school show if I wanted to, you know, it, it felt like there was fun to be had at looking at these sort of not one dimensional, but, you know, multicam kids kind of kids show kind of characters and doing this experiment about like, okay, but what if they were real? And then if they were and they grew up, what what would what kind of more fleshed out adult characters would they be and that's how you got to kind of weirder swings like zach morris is the governor of california stuff yeah like that. who who's the most who's the trickiest character to figure out where they'd be today you know i i think um i i, I think we're there's more this season uh we got we got a better i, I felt like for me it was like a little hard um, with uh, Kelly, I, I think, because she, in the original show, she was, I mean, she's who I wanted to be, but she was like hot and nice, you know, which doesn't feel like it's, it lends itself to comedy where, you know, the, uh, Zach was kind of terrible and manipulative and, and always kind of scamming on people and whatever. And Jesse was neurotic and Slater was sort of 
you know, kind of like an imbecile. And so, it, you know, I think we get into it a little more this season in a fun way that, um, you know, getting to see like, well, what does a character who's kind of, uh, whose main characteristic is nice? Like what, what, what does that really mean? What's behind that? And where does, and, and what is, what does that adult be? You, what does a child like that become as an adult? So a person who's kind of always, you know, uh, sort of there as, a helper to her husband. Um, and so, you know, uh, yeah, Tiffany's in a couple episodes this season where we get into that a little more. Yeah. Um, and I think like an episode where you're able to delve into those sort of particular elements of the show was the, uh, the Todd capsule episode where we have right. homecoming and things and it's sort of like the focus of that episode shifts a bit more to the sort of the teachers and the older characters, um, that have re returned, what was uh, like, what was the sort of most special moment of that episode for you? Um, they were having them all in there. Um, it, it was wild, like having them all in their like, those like Zach attack, like fake rock band costumes from the original show. Um, just for me, like the, you know, the seven year olds inside of me wa watching this with, you know, it's <laughs> just kind of like, this is crazy. It, it, it really is a surreal, weird thing to sort of, you know, grow up with something and then be the, as an adult in charge of a set where you can be like, Zach and Kelly kiss again. <laughs> you know, it's too much power. It's dangerous. Yeah. Have you had from anyone that like either, uh, maybe hasn't watched the show in a long time or people have never seen say by the bell before or watch the show going um sort of I don't like boy that Todman guy I don't remember him from the original show yeah, sure. yeah or like sure. or like I've gone back and watched the re I still can't He's find not there guy. right because the <laughs> right the thing uh yeah the thing that people were really into from that episode was we put John Michael Higgins in a bunch of old clips from the show pretending he was in the original show um yeah he is such an uh he's such a hilarious actor and I've worked with him before too and so when I was uh, you know when I was developing this it was like who do I and I had no idea how any of you know the show is so much about all these new kids but also the old ones and I was like I don't know if anyone like is I haven't seen a lot of the you know even Mario like I, I hadn't seen a lot of them do comedy very like mm. a, a recently or hadn't worked with them myself and you know so I was the idea of having John Michael Higgins who I knew and it was so funny uh was really appealing to me but then what was such an awesome treat was then getting the set and being like oh Mario Lopez is like Daniel Day Lewis like he's like a wonderful actor and he's like so funny like in his own right I would like develop a show with him any day about anything and all of them Elizabeth's so good Mark Paul Mark Paul like is so funny and precise and you know they're all really really good which was uh, a, a really nice surprise that I didn't know they were they're great mm. we we're talking about this like sort of like line between homage and uh, sort of parody of the original series and I think something that you do in this uh, series to sort of maybe help with that is have the Douglas High kids join Bayview and sort right. of shifting the perspective of the show where you've got your Zach Morris type character, his son, Mac, uh, sort of not be the center of the show, but be sort of the character through like which like right. sort of a side character that the that we get to he's like the villain <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. yeah a little bit that's how you meet him yeah yeah and and devil... it felt, that felt like the funniest way to do it is to redo it in a way where I, I just thinking about like if you thought about the original show it's like Bayside is this all-american high school where the kids just get into hijinks and prank their principal and never have any actual problems it's like the funniest way to see a weird place like that is to kind of give it the context of, oh, there this school is like this because it's so privileged and it's so wealthy. And, you know, and the funniest way into that is through the POV of a kid um, whose life does have real problems and who, you know, who can't just uh, prank their principal and blow off class or whatever, who, who everything means so much to them, um, you know? And so it felt like Daisy was like, a really organic way and a funny way to kind of view this really weird world. And because of that premise, it, you know, 
ultimately it makes the show just kind of uh, open to all these conversations that you would never expect from a Saved by the Bell reboot about, you know, education and class and race. And, you know, that was, that was the most fun of seeing positive reviews for the show after it came out was headlines that were like, I thought this was going to be terrible, but it was like, a, it was like a really profound conversation about about education inequality in in America, but everyone you know was assuming it would be bad. I guess yeah. sounds yeah. like it might be bad. Must be yeah, must be funny to read reviews where it's like we were expecting, we were really ready for with the negative review to go. Oh, we wanted to hate it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like they had. I wonder what headlines they had ready to go. Like, you know, I, I mean, yeah, yeah, no, it's been, and it's so great. Like, I, I'm, I've been so happy that people gave it a chance, and you know, have responded so positively to it, both fans of the show and also people who, you know, have never seen the show and are just coming to it, and they're like, oh, this is a high school show with something interesting to say. Yeah, um, and I, I, I think with like Daisy uh, being sort of more the the center of the show, like the timeouts have a whole new meaning as well like it's sort of more hey hey, time out let's comment on what's happening like here like there's a bit it 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 seems to break the fourth wall even more than the zach morris ones do because it's always commenting on the show yeah because you know there were certain things it's weird that we kind of inherited that it felt like oh it might it's like a missed opportunity to not do so then kind of thinking about like well what is like the modern the modern justification maybe for these kind of timeouts because on the original it would be like mark paul would be like hey look at that sexy lady or whatever just make some weird comment to the audience um you know kind of like uh (laughs) saying something offensive about a woman or what but um it felt like for daisy because she is in this kind of unsafe space she's a girl from uh, a school that got shut down and now she's coming to this uh, very moneyed school where she does not feel comfortable at least for the first season we we use timeouts a lot for like things like you're saying like things that she would not feel comfortable saying out loud uh, calling out kind of like uh do, did you just see that or you know calling out microaggressions or things that you know she were making her feel uncomfortable but um, you know, she could tell the audience, but couldn't say out loud. Um, and then as she became more comfortable in the space and, you know, in the second season and stuff, it feels like there's fun opportunities to use them for different reasons too. Um, but yeah, it seemed like kind of like looking at like Fleabag and other, uh, you know, more modern examples of breaking the fifth, the, the fifth wall, the fourth wall. What is it? The third wall? Yeah, breaking the How many walls wall. are there? I don't know. I think it's, it's I think it's I think it's the fourth wall. Because I think like it's almost like a like I think it's like a theater thing, maybe, or but or a multi-gap thing where you got the yes, three the walls wall. and then right. the fourth one is the yeah, yeah the bit yes, where they right. can't. You would build. be in the Pentagon when you're in the, when you're shooting in the Pentagon and it's breaking the fifth wall. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about yeah uh what and you mentioned like sort of how the show's been able to address uh issues like um uh integration and sort of uh the the privileged schools versus uh the less advantaged schools and funding and all this sort of stuff um what like how 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 helpful do you think it is with a sort of sort of silly comedy uh being able to address these important issues in terms of maybe yeah helping yeah. people sort of maybe swallow uncomfortable yeah, messages yeah i mean listen like the always my primary intention in everything i've ever written is to make something that is funny like that's number one i'm my my primary goal is not like i have an important message about education that's gonna fix it so let me give it to you in a medicine you can understand like that's yeah. not what i'm doing here it, you know i but on the other hand it's like I'm never going to write some, or I, I don't have an interest in writing something that doesn't have something to say or, or isn't answering the question. Like, why does, why is this, you know, why does this have to be on television right now? You know? So it's a balance a little bit. And I think like, even more than I realized, like I, I was kind of approaching it a little bit from just like, wh- what will be the most comically satisfying way to see this ridiculous school Cool. Mm. Um, but just baked into the premise, I think even more than I realized, like before I started the room, it's like, it just like when you're telling stories like that, you have to know exactly the right thing you are trying to say 
about um, privilege, about race, about, you know, about a bunch of different things. And so it became very important. And I knew this, you know, as soon as I pitched the show, it, it became very important to make sure the writer's room was like very diverse in a way that I have never been in a, a room diverse in this way before. Like, you know, and, and, and I'm not just talking about racially, it's also like socioeconomically and people who come from different backgrounds and different experiences, because it is not my experience. I did not grow up in LA. I, I did not go to, you know, a public school that was underfunded and up down, like, you know, and so just being able to have conversations in the room uh, so that we could all be really clear on like, what are we saying here and, and make sure it, it feels authentic like that was very important and I think you can feel it even though it is listen it's a Saved by the Bell reboot like it you know <laughs> it's not the wire but yeah. but still even when you're doing that like you you know what you're trying to say and, and I think um that diverse having a diverse room help, helped us do that yeah this, this this answer can be as silly or as serious as you like, but uh, what's something you realized about the original Saved by the Bell, uh, like with 2020 goggles on having to re sort of not rewrite the show, but write a new version of the show? You know, I, I, I mean, I think I realized one thing and then I have since realized another thing. And it's like, when I first came into this, I was like, oh, wouldn't it be funny to kind of go back, watch the show and poke fun at like, you know, the it, it kind of with like, you know, yeah, with 2020 goggles on kind of poke fun at like, oh, the things we thought were okay to say that we aren't anymore. I mean, and there were certainly enough of those, like there are fat jokes that are really, that are really rough. Like Zach dresses up like a Native American, like women have no agency whatsoever. Certainly like th those things are all mm. true. But the thing I will say in doing the show is like the, I have since also found myself being like, like, also give them a friggin' break. Cause like the show, the original mm. show was really great in a lot of ways. Like it was really, it was so diverse in, in, you know, in a way like, you know, Lisa Turtle was like a fashion -y, cool black girl at school, it, you know, in a way that was really exciting, um, I think for people and, and Mario and, you know, and I think like, I, I just, it, it's so unfair because it's like, this is, tr this isn't just true of Save by the Belt. This is true of all shows. And this will be true of this show that it's like 20 years from now, you look back at this show and like, I mean, working, looking at back at my career, looking at like jokes we told on 30 Rock and stuff, I now, you know, you could do the same thing where it's like, oh, that wasn't cool. But hindsight's 2020, you don't know that. And so I think like in doing this show, coming into it with this attitude of like, ha ha ha, there's so much stuff to make fun of. I also have like a lot of, a lot of sympathy and, and you know, and gratitude for the people who made the original show and I hope the people who remake this show making fun of it in 20 years have that same kind of empathy for me. You know, it's, it's just like the world is changing really fast. And uh, and I think that's a lot of what the show is about. It's like we have this nostalgia. We also have this need all the time to kind of be like, oh, but we're not like that anymore. But it's like, no, we are, <laughs> you know, so you, you were very conscious of the 2050 Saved by the Bell. Yes. <laughs> reboot. And I want them to be kind to me. Yeah. <laughs> What? Don't rip on me too hard. I'm just trying my best. <laughs> yeah. And I think the interesting thing is um, that when we look at these characters, particularly the current sort of students, the current original Bayside students in this, like the, the Max and the Jamies and things, is like it does seem like their, their sins often are coming from a place of ignorance. Yes. Like, yes. Not, totally. not, not malice. No. And I think that's the heart of the sh the heart of the show is is it's coming from like a hopeful place it's like people you know people can't change what they don't know they need to change you know and and so I I think that's kind of like the lovely thing as we watch like these characters and more in season two and hopefully seasons going everybody's taking these tiny micro steps towards each other and understanding the place where the other ones are coming from so you know we try to be generous even with like the you know bad characters yeah. or whatever yeah 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 and ignorance it's not a good thing but yeah. it's seen in this show as a curable thing as a cure like, uh, hopefully yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. I hope. um just before we finish tracy what was the funniest moment for you in the first season of say by the bell 
Oh. Your version. Oh, let's see. Wait, I'm sure it was something. You know, it was John, it, it was John Michael Higgins. Man, he just, I, he's my muse. He, he just like makes me laugh in a way that nothing's ever made me laugh. I think it might've been maybe cause I'm just thinking of it when he was dressed, when he was dressed in, um, cause we dressed him like he was in the nineties and he's sitting like how we were shooting. It was so ridiculous. Cause he's like on a green couch next to like a green man <laughs> talking is ridiculous, pretending to be back in the nineties on a couch <laughs> next to Johnny Dakota. Yeah. And he's yelling in Kelly Kapowski's face. Cause she has been offered drugs. This is like her from the original show has been offered drugs and he's screaming in her face. Like, no, this isn't who we are. Kelly. <laughs> and it's just like seeing on the screen that he's talking to a person from 30 years ago. And here he's sitting in this like weird green landscape. It was just like the most surreal thing I've ever seen. And yeah. And I, I laughed like really hard. So I cried. I, I, I love it where he comes in on the surfboard and falls off the stage. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. And even like the falling off the stage, I feel is less funny than him thinking like that that would be cool him coming out on the surf hey guys yeah, yeah. this was how yeah. he wanted to do announcements he thought yeah. this was a good idea well tracy <laughs> thank you so much for talking to us today um all the best of luck for saved thank by you. the bell uh with the upcoming emmy awards and people watching this interview you can go to goldderby.com to watch other interviews with awards contenders thanks so much tracy thanks matt